Welcome everyone to the Shannon Clark Lecture, an annual event hosted by the English department. Every year, the department invites a prominent literary scholar and teacher to campus. That visitor makes a public presentation on Thursday evening, the event for which we're gathered. And on Friday, our guests will lead a special half-day class for English majors and prospective majors and faculty members at a department retreat. Tonight's speaker is Professor James Shapiro from Columbia University. Before I introduce Jim, let me tell you a little about the Shannon Clark Lecture Series, and if you would, you can just follow along in your program. The Shannon Clark Lectures in English, established by a, by a gift from a Washington and Lee alumnus who wishes to remain anonymous, honors the memory of Edgar Finley Shannon, chairman of Washington and Lee's Department of English from 1914 until his death in 1938, and Harriet Mabel Fishburne Clark, a grandmother of the donor and a woman vitally interested in liberal education. This lecture is also part of a much larger set of events to celebrate the 400th anniversary of William Shakespeare's death in April 1616. WNL has put together an ambitious array of theatrical, musical, and dance performances, a special exhibit with prints borrowed from the Folger Shakespeare Library, and an impressive set of guest speakers, including literary scholars, historians, and philosophers. Two of our own faculty members, Gemma Levy in theater and Chris Cavaller in English, have written original works inspired by Shakespeare that will have their premiere this year. We have called our celebration Shakespeare 2016, and I hope you each received a bookmark as you came in. That bookmark has printed on its reverse the schedule of upcoming events. WNL is also leading and participating in a statewide effort called the Virginia Shakespeare Initiative, which is promoting and publicizing dozens of Shakespeare events across the state. You can visit their website for more information. Just Google Virginia Shakespeare Initiative. And for the true Shakespeare buffs in your audience, in our audience tonight, be sure to mark down October 2016, almost a year from now. That's when UVA will be hosting an exhibition of the first folio, the first edition of Shakespeare's collected works published in 1623, seven years after his death. So tonight, I have the honor of introducing Jim Shapiro. I will not read the description of Jim's career and many accomplishments in the program. I hope you've had an opportunity to do that for yourselves. Simply put, Jim is among the most important and influential Shakespeareans of his generation. Not only has he been remarkably prolific, producing six major books as well as editing a number of volumes, but he has reached a wide public audience for his work, an audience that most academics can only fantasize about. His books, 1599, and now the new book, 1606, are cultural and literary histories of a single year in Shakespeare's career, offering fascinating and fresh connections between the times and the work. His book, Contested Will, is a wonderfully accessible examination and a wonderfully told tale of the authorship question that manufactured and dis dishearteningly persistent controversy over who wrote Shakespeare. He is regularly consulted as a Shakespeare expert. And just in this last month, you might have seen an opinion piece in the New York Times or heard him interviewed on NPR. Jim reaches a large audience because he disguises his enormous erudition and exhaustive research beneath the graceful and lucid style of a master storyteller. If you have not had the pleasure of reading some of Jim's work, several of his books, including his just released new title, the Year of Lear, Shakespeare in 1606, will be available for purchase at the end of the evening, and Jim has agreed to sign copies. I have known Jim on and off since the days back in the early 80s when we would bump into each other in the hotel at MLA, going from interview to interview in genial competition as we each hope to land our first academic job. I have watched with admiration over the years as he has become one of William Shakespeare's most eloquent and effective ambassadors. He will speak tonight on Shakespeare in America. It is a special pleasure to ask you to join me in welcoming Jim Shapiro to WNL. We were both a lot younger then. Uh, 
That was a really lovely and gracious. Can you hear me in the back okay? If I begin to fade, just cup an ear and let me know. That was a really lovely uh, introduction. And it has been a terrific day for me at Washington and Lee. I got to work with a number of the students who I see here in the audience. Uh, was just excited by the intelligence, the openness, the playfulness of the students I work with today. So I'm very much looking forward to the retreat tomorrow. And I'm looking forward to speaking at you now for 47 minutes, <laughs> 44 minutes, and then opening this up to Q&A. Because I know when I come to hear a talk, I have a question, and so do 13 other people, and they never get to mine. So I'm hoping that we'll mix it up a little bit. I'm most comfortable with that. I'm always asked to present something, and I'm going to do that in this talk. It's called Shakespeare in America. And it's a subject that I've been thinking about for the last three, four years. And I'm teaching right now at Columbia and have been uh, for the last few years as well. I'm not done with it yet. There are many corners of this country that are yielding its secrets and its stories about Shakespeare. And one of the pleasures of coming to Virginia was thinking more about Shakespeare in Virginia. So. There's a little detour in the middle of this about Virginia, and I've left out some other stuff to accommodate it. The story of Shakespeare in America, when it has been told, which is less often than you might think, tends to be recounted in one of two ways. The first more or less follows the contours of Beatrice and Benedict's relationship in Much Ado About Nothing. In the distant past, it was a powerful relationship between an attraction between America and England's national poet. But before anything came of it, they went their separate ways until at last they rediscovered each other, how well matched they really were, and ever since have been inseparable. The other narrative is best told in Lawrence Levine's influential book, Highbrow, Lowbrow, The Emergence of Cultural Hierarchy in America. This one has a less cheerful ending and follows the line of Paradise Lost. There was a magical moment in the mid-19th century where in America, Shakespeare was widely, almost universally available across the social classes and across the land. Tocqueville's famous remark, quote, there's hardly a pioneer's hut which does not contain a few odd volumes of Shakespeare is invariably trotted out by people who tell this story. All was going well until, unfortunately, American culture suddenly split into elite and popular spheres. The date that this Edenic moment came to an end can be pinpointed more or less to May 10th, 1849, <laughs> the date of the Astor Place riots. And for those of you who don't know about the Astor Place riots, this was when working class Americans protested a highbrow British production of Macbeth in downtown Manhattan, the militia was called out, and many Americans there protesting were killed and wounded when fired upon. I should confess I'm drawn to both of these narratives, could easily elaborate on either of them here. I'm drawn to them in the same way that I was drawn as a child to Rudyard Kipling's Just So stories. Uh, they explain simply and appealingly how things turn out, they're easy to pitch in a public lecture. They're just not true. And I'm going to try to <laughs> push beyond them. The problem I kept running into while thinking about this problem and putting together a Library of America volume on Shakespeare in America is that neither of these explain what I found so powerful and so urgent in many of the stories, poems, plays, essays, and parodies that American writers have written about and through Shakespeare. So tonight I'd like to offer up a third and provisional and competing explanation of how and why Shakespeare has mattered in America in ways that even diverge from how he has mattered in other countries, in Japan or Korea or Brazil where he's increasingly popular, or Israel or Italy and elsewhere. So this is a particularly American perspective that I'm offering. There are things that we as Americans, 
tend not to talk about or talk about very well, mostly things that continue to divide us. And if you don't know what that is, just tune into a Democratic or Republican debate over the next couple of months and you'll get a good sense of that. Sometimes we don't talk about these things because we can't quite articulate what they are. Sometimes we can't talk about them because we're not honest enough with ourselves to admit the ways in which we believe one thing and say another when these subjects come up. My argument then is that American poets and playwrights, novelists and essayists have turned to Shakespeare time and again to say what they can't express any other way or can't express quite so clearly or honestly. Shakespeare serves as a touchstone and we as Americans have turned to his works to test sometimes harsh and otherwise suppress truths about ourselves. In offering this argument, I'm suggesting that taken together, what American writers have said about Shakespeare over the past 240 years or so offers an alternative, if less soothing or reassuring version of US history. I'd like to flesh out this argument by offering brief case histories of three American writers who engaged with Shakespeare. The first was America's sixth president. The second was a social and political reformer, the first American woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And the third, a Japanese-American short story writer who was incarcerated during the Second World War in Utah. The three whose works move us westward from Boston to Chicago to Oakland cover a broad geographical range as well. And I hope through exploring some of the things that they have written about Shakespeare, and I could have easily have chosen from a dozen of others, to persuade you that Shakespeare has occupied a distinctive place in an America that has long struggled with what divides us. Whether the issue is race or immigration or who counts as one of us, paternalism in the industrial workplace, militarism, even family and marriage. Issues, obviously, that continue to divide us and challenge us today. In this day, in this way, Shakespeare remains as necessary and as meaningful as ever to our culture in identifying and even perhaps in helping us navigate beyond these divisions. Before turning to the first of these three case studies, I'd like to describe in an anecdote, which is both near and dear to Hank as well as to me in our studies, a wonderful anecdote, the best anecdote I know about Shakespeare in America. And it's about an amateur performance that took place a little over 150 years ago, which I would have paid a lot of money to have witnessed. It took place in a small trading post at the recently founded community of Corpus Christi, Texas. I have to ask here, is anybody from Corpus Christi? Because I'm not going to say very nice things or report very nice things about it. In January 1846, over half of the US Army was gathered in Corpus Christi, the largest troop concentration since the War of 1812. They were sent there to provoke a war with Mexico after Texas had been annexed as a slave state. Such a war, if successful, would likely lead to the creation of even more slave states. Mexico at the time did not allow slavery. This was a controversial military campaign, one that would, opponents warn, lead inexorably to a civil war over the issue of slavery, though it was viewed by its advocates as part of America's manifest destiny, a phrase that had just been created by journalists earlier that year. Whatever their views or the politics of their mission, the soldiers sent to Texas had far too much time on their hands while they sat around awaiting orders to cross the Rio Grande and commence hostilities. One of the officers there described Corpus Christi as, and I quote, the most murderous, thieving, gambling, cutthroat, godforsaken hole in Texas, which must have been something. <laughs> in order to distract the idle troops, Captain John B. Magruder, and you'll be familiar with some of these names, Captain John B. Magruder oversaw the building of a playhouse called the Union Theater, large enough to hold 800 spectators. He and other officers fell to work painting scenery, rehearsing plays, including Shakespeare's Othello. 
In retrospect, it seems an excruciatingly apt choice, for it was a play that mercilessly explores what it meant to be a white woman in love with a black man who himself had been enslaved, a play about the costs of war set at the crossroads of empire. Admission to the Union Theater wasn't cheap. A box seat cost a dollar and a place in the pit half that, but the productions played to full houses and quickly paid off the cost of the playhouse. An officer named Theodoric Porter was asked to play the Moor, and James Longstreet, who, as you know, like Magruder, later served as a distinguished Confederate general, was initially cast as Desdemona. But Longstreet was my height and size and did not look right for the part of Desdemona. <laughs> so they looked around and they found another officer who was five foot seven or so, just 135 pounds. He had a beard coming in, but he was the closest they could come. <laughs> and his name, the name of this more petite uh, Desdemona was Ulysses S. Grant. <laughs> Longstreet, as you know, I'm not making any of this up, I promise. I told you it was the best anecdote. Uh, it goes downhill from here. Longstreet survived the war, and he was interviewed after the war and asked about this production, among other things. He recalled, and I quote, Grant looked very like a girl dressed up. He really rehearsed the part of Desdemona, but he did not have much sentiment. Grant apparently didn't shave his beard, as I said, because he had written to Julia's fiance a month later, I've allowed my beard to grow two or three inches, so you have to really imagine him cross-dressed in this part. Um, no photograph survives. The casting produced one of those strange moments when art imitates life. Even as Michael Cassio had served as a go-between, carrying letters between Othello and Desdemona, in Shakespeare's play, so Theodoric Porter had done for Grant because Grant's fiancée, Julia, uh, had a father who, like Brabantio in the play, did not approve of her choice of husband. Despite their friendship, in the course of their rehearsals, Theodoric Porter ended up objecting to playing Othello to Grant's Desdemona. A, in Longstreet's words, Porter said it was bad enough to play the part with a, with a woman in the cast, but he couldn't pump up any sentiment with Grant dressed up as Desdemona. So although Grant had rehearsed the part, he was replaced by a professional actor and actress sent in from New Orleans to take over the role for him, which is a shame. <laughs> Biographical connections with Shakespeare's tragedy would shadow Grant. When, for instance, he had to leave the army for a while in 1854 because of drunkenness, a fellow soldier trying to explain to a friend what had happened compared Grant to Shakespeare's flawed but noble lieutenant in Othello, and I quote, he took to liquor, not in enormous quantities, but he drank far less than other officers, but like Cassio, Grant had a poor brain for drinking. The weakness did not belong to his character, for in all other respects, he was a man of unusual self-control. It's kind of offhand reference to Shakespearean characters, uh, Michael Cassio here, with the assumption that any letter writer would understand, or most letter readers would understand at this time, that gives you a sense of how familiar 19th century Americans were across the social classes with Shakespeare's most popular plays. The staging of Othello at Corpus Christi invites more questions than the few surviving details of this production can begin to answer. Not least of all, why Othello of all plays? And since it was Othello, how did this production speak to its time and place? For inevitably, the playgoers of Corpus Christi responded in markedly different ways than we might today. Othello must have meant something different uh, to soldiers, insofar as this is also a play about military life, including in the Cyprus scenes, soldiers with too much time in their hands who are prone to drinking and violence. For officers in 1846, in an American army that at this time offered little opportunity for promotion, Iago's grievances about his standing in relation to Michael Cassio's would have resonated powerfully, especially given the sometimes bitter conflicts among the officers gathered 
who there over who had precedence, those with brevets, that is, temporary promotions based on merit, or those who held seniority and rank the old-fashioned way, as Iago put it, where each second stood heir to the first. But for these men, both performing and watching the play, the fellow inescapably must have also been about race, and the American soldiers in Corpus Christi were well aware that the decision to send them there to fight and for a sixth of them, including Theodoric Porter, to die in what Grant later called a wicked and unjust Mexican war, were driven in part by a desire to extend the reach of slavery. Now, you'd think that a play about a black general eloping with a white woman would have been unpopular, if not taboo, in slave states. But the opposite was true. In the quarter century before the Civil War, Othello was regularly staged in the South, 20 times, for example, in Memphis, and strong evidence uh, that white Southerners could turn a blind eye towards the play's portrayal of so incendiary an issue as miscegenation, inescapable no matter how heavily edited the script was or how much the hero's skin color was lightened in performance. Shakespeare scholars talk of this as the bronze age of Othello, not too white, not too black, kind of a copper tone bronze in the middle. Yet in the antebellum South, it was unremarkable that a slave could be named after Shakespeare's tragic hero, as we learn from the description of what's described as a lusty runaway Negro boy called Othello that was posted in the South Carolina Gazette. And I wonder how many readers of that Gazette noted the irony that this young man's Shakespearean namesake had himself been sold to slavery before he was redeemed from that condition. It was only after the outbreak of the war that productions of Othello quickly fell out of favor in the South, presumably because it was no longer possible to see the play in such blinkered ways, except that merely imagining that race wasn't an issue in the play and in America. One of the last holdouts was a, a writer, a great writer from Delaware named Mary Preston, about whom we know very little, but she wrote a series of essays about Shakespeare and the war from the perspective of the Confederacy that she supported. And she continued to insist in her essay on Othello that Othello was a white man. So you can just see how Shakespeare continued to give people at this time a way of dealing with the crises they were living through. And I should say in passing that in no period in our nation's history was Shakespeare often or more painfully invoked than during the Civil War. Not only in the letters from the men on the battlefields, both North and South, but also such luminaries as Emily Dickinson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Mark Twain, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Herman Melville, and President Lincoln as well, as well as the man who would assassinate him, John Wilkes Booth, who quoted lines from Julius Caesar in justifying his act. Shakespeare's works enabled a nation at war to grapple with the enormity of the conflict and with the unspeakable loss and suffering on both sides. Interest in Shakespeare at that time certainly differed regionally. In the North and especially in New England, a deeply puritanical and anti-theatrical prejudice persisted, and it just runs through the work of Emerson, Holmes, and Dickinson. The Shakespeare who is praised in Boston is more often than not the moralizing Shakespeare of the page. In the South, there was a far richer appreciation of the theatricality of the plays. And these plays were staged during the war years in Augusta, Savannah, Atlanta. This is during the war when precious resources had to be spent in Wilmington, Montgomery, and Selma, and even as we saw in Corpus Christi in army camps in the Confederacy. In February 1863, in the midst of some of the worst fighting of the war, about 130 miles from here in Richmond, a beautiful new theater was built. The inaugural play was As You Like It. And one of the leading actors of the day, Walter Keeble, recited a prize-winning poem by a poet named Henry Timrod, celebrated as the laureate of the Confederacy a poem that circulated widely after this in Southern newspapers. In his poem, 
celebrating the theater as a fairy ring drawn in the crimson of a battle plain. Henry Timrod would subtly trace through Shakespeare's creations an allegory of the South's engagement in the war, from Miranda-like innocence to Lear's confrontation with the storm to Desdemona's experience of betrayal, culminating in a Hamlet scarred by loss who must take up arms against a sea of troubles and yet knows that he is doomed. Timrod prefiguring and helping to frame in the poem's allusion to the dear rights from which we fight and pray the narrative of the lost cause that would emerge in greater prominence after the defeat of the Confederacy. Shakespeare would then prove crucial to the construction of many distinctive American identities. Let me turn to my case studies now. And the first one also concerns Othello. It's an essay called The Character of Desdemona, and it's written by John Quincy Adams, one of our earliest presidents, and he published it in 1835. And it's a work that complicates well-established historical narratives of our nation's past. Adams was born in 1767, and he would go on again to be the sixth president of the United States and then a congressman from Massachusetts. <clears throat> Later in life, Adams recalled that he had been, quote, man and boy, a reader of Shakespeare three score years, adding that a pocket edition of his works was on my mother's nursery table. Now, John Quincy Adams' anti-slavery record was matched by very few Americans. He had famously attacked slaveholding from the floor of the House of Representatives, defended African Americans before the Supreme Court in the case of the United States versus Amistad, and vocally opposed the war with Mexico and the annexation of Texas. His credentials as an abolitionist were impeccable, and he saw himself, he said, as the acutest, the astutest, the archest enemy of Southern slavery that ever existed. So it was cons with considerable interest that I picked up his essay on Othello. And it is shocking. Because he thought slavery was one thing, sexual relations, even love, between a black and a white, something else entirely. And his essay is a persistent and outright attack on Desdemona for choosing a black man as her love. I'll read you snippets of it. And my point in this really is, whatever people think about themselves, once they start to write about Shakespeare, they reveal things that they are not even aware of. In this case, obviously, what I see as the hypocrisy of Adams. My objections, he writes, to the character of Desdemona arise not from what Iago or Rodrigo or Othello say of her, but what for she herself does. She absconds from her father's house in the dead of night to marry a blackamoor. She breaks her father's heart, covers his noble house with shame to gratify what? Pure love, like that of Juliet or Miranda? No, a natural passion. It cannot be mentioned misogyny, with delicacy. Her admirers now say, this is criticism of 1835, that the color of Othello has nothing to do with the passion of Desdemona. No? Why, if Othello had been white, what need would there have been for her running away with him? She could have made no better match. Her father could have made no reasonable objection. It goes on and on and on and on. One of the strangest misogynistic rants and also anti-intermarriage between black and white rants that I've ever read, certainly written by a US president. His reflections on Othello capture the contradictions of ostensibly liberal antebellum views of slavery and interracial marriage. It's disheartening, disheartening to read Adams so staunch an opponent of slavery, concluding his essay by declaring that the moral of Othello is that the intermarriage of black and white blood is a violation of the law of nature. That is the lesson, he writes, to be learned from the play. His deep discomfort with the play 
was shared, in fact, by his mother, Abigail Adams, another strong opponent of slavery, who had seen Sarah Siddons play Desdemona opposite John Philip Kemble in London in 1785 and wrote to a friend of hers, quote, my whole soul shuddered whenever I saw the Sooty Moor touch fair Desdemona. And she had felt this revulsion, even though she knew that Kemble was a white actor playing Othello in blackface. Now, when her son's essay was finally published, the Philadelphia National Gazette and the Georgetown Metropolitan sharply criticized Adams for his harsh view of Desdemona. Stung, he wrote a few days later to a friend defending, but not changing, his views. The great moral lesson, he writes, of Othello is that black and white blood cannot be intermingled in marriage. His volatile essay first appeared in the midst of the Civil War reprinted in 1863 in a volume that was given to President Lincoln. And I wonder what Lincoln must have made of the writing of his predecessor. My second case study turns on another great Shakespearean tragedy. This essay is called A Modern Lear, and it was written by Jane Addams. And this was published in 1895. Adams with 2D, no relation to either earlier president. She's best remembered now for Hull House in Chicago and for her political and social reforming and also for having won a Nobel Peace Prize. She, too, was deeply interested in Shakespeare, wrote about him in her college essays that survive to this day. But for those of you who have read her Shakespearean college essays, Nothing in them prepares you for her essay, A Modern Lear, in which Adams leads Shakespeare's tragedy against the recent and bloody Pullman strike, a national crisis that had far-reaching consequences for American industry, labor, and government. For those of you who have not thought or read about the Pullman strike in a while, Pullman was an extraordinary figure who was at the center of the rail industry. And he was crucial to the communication network and the travel networks in this country. And in the 1890s, there was a dip in the economy, and he had to lay off workers. And he did so. The problem was, Pullman also believed himself to be a great, great man for the people. And he required his workers to live in a town he built specially for them. And he called this town Pullman. And they had to get oil and water and all utilities from Pullman. And they had to buy all their provisions from the Pullman store. And he created a little kingdom of Pullman. And when he laid off these workers, they could not pay their rent. And they begged him to cut them some slack or to rehire them. And he did not. And he was outraged when they went on strike. And this strike was a national strike and quickly a violent one. And it only ended when President Grover Cleveland sent in federal troops to suppress it. Now, Jane Addams was probably finishing her essay on a modern Lear in late 1895, and its roots can be traced to a speech she gave in New York that she subsequently developed uh, before other groups in Chicago and elsewhere. And in that speech, she drew analogies between Shakespeare's play and the tragedy set in motion by the patronizing and for her patriarchal George Pullman, who resented the ingratitude of his workers and saw himself, like King Lear, as a man more sinned against than sinning. One of the things that makes her essay so fascinating is that she came from the same privileged class as Pullman did. And he had expected her to side with him. She was also subject on a familial level to a patriarchal Lear-like father, uh, one who had refused her permission to go study, uh, go to college in the East. He wanted her near home in the Midwest under his supervision. So I think few people in America in 1895 were better equipped to know what King Lear was like from it watching her father, who luckily had passed away for her, luckily, had passed away by now, and George Pullman. 
it's hard sometimes if you're familiar with a biography to know then when reading this essay whether she's writing about Cordelia or herself. This is what Adams writes in this essay. It shocks our ideal of family life that a man should fail to know his daughter's heart because she awkwardly expressed a love that he should refuse to comfort and advise her through all difference of opinions and clashings of will. So it's a fascinating essay in which she is drifting in and out of the subject position of Cordelia, critiquing a Lear-like patriarchal <coughs> figure. She proposes that the relation of the British king, Lear, to his family is very like the relation of the president of the Pullman Company to his town. The denouement of a daughter's break with a father suggests the break of the employees with their benefactor. If we call one an example of the domestic tragedy, the other of the industrial tragedy, it is possible, she writes, to make them illuminate each other. In a message that hasn't lost its force a century later, Jane Addams' Shakespeare becomes a prescription, a warning, especially timely today, for a way forward in American industrial and familial relations. And I'll quote her again. Is it too much to hope that some of us will carefully consider this modern tragedy, if perchance it may contain a warning for the troublous times in which we live, by considering the dramatic failure of the liberal employee's plans for his employees, liberal employer's plans for his employees, we may possibly be spared useless industrial tragedies in the uncertain future which lies ahead of us. Pullman caught wind of this essay and he resented this speech that she was giving bitterly and let it be known. When Jane Addams went to magazine after magazine up and down the East Coast and elsewhere in this country to try to publish this really brilliant essay, she discovered that Pullman had called there first and made sure that no one would dare publish it. A disappointed Jane Addams shared it with the great educator uh, and philosopher John Dewey, who called it, quote, one of the greatest things I've ever read as to its form and its ethical philosophy. It was only published years after Pullman's death in 1612 in a minor journal called The Survey. And even then, it stirred up controversy in American newspapers. Few writings about Shakespeare have so touched a nerve. And to my mind, it's one of the great New Historicist Essays, a century before anyone had come up with the idea of New Historicism. It's just buried in our American past, like so many great things that have been written about Shakespeare. My first two case studies touched on struggles in our nation's history that we can't quite seem to get past, and that Shakespeare's works allow us to see with unusual clarity struggles over the desire of the powerful to control the sexual lives and working lives of others. My final example turns to uh, an even broader issue, and that is one that continues to divide this nation of immigrants. Who really is American? And how can Shakespeare help answer this question? Time and again in this melting pot nation, Shakespeare has played a major role in defining both inclusion and exclusion from what it means to be an American. Once again, the comforting dividing lines, liberals versus conservatives, northerners versus southerners, creative types versus reactionaries, get complicated and confounded. I'm thinking here of a couple of pieces from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, that tackle the matter of immigration through Shakespeare. One is by the Bostonian Henry Cabot Lodge. Uh, he was also uh, a U.S. senator who did his best to impose restrictions on immigration and uh, promote U.S. imperialism, and whose 1895 essay on Shakespeare's Americanism enlists the Bard to oppose those unwashed masses that were for Lodge diluting the American culture and language he had imbibed at Harvard and he was striving to protect. An even more striking example comes from the address that was given in 1932 when the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. was first opened. Dignitaries, foreign amb you know, ambassadors, uh, even Herbert Hoover was in the audience when a professor from Cornell University 
Joseph Quincy Adams, no relation to any of the Adams <laughs> that I've mentioned, had been brought in to be the first scholar to run the Folger Library. And I was only able to find the one surviving copy of this talk at the Folger. It was missing somehow in the library, and the librarians were able to, after much uh, work, rediscover this missing manuscript. And I've, it's included in my, um, it was published in a tiny magazine, and I've included it in my anthology for the Library of America. But Quincy Adams argues that Shakespeare has to play a crucial role in ensuring a homogenous nation by retaining a culture that is still essentially English. When America, he writes, seemed destined to become a babble of tongues and cultures, the required teaching of Shakespeare's works in American classrooms helped combat the forces of immigration that had become a menace to the preservation of our long-established English civilization. So this is where we were with Shakespeare in 1932 in this country. And it reminds you that Shakespeare has always been appropriated in the culture wars, not simply in the 80s and in the 90s. My final example comes from an individual who struggled to find his way into the community of Americans. And he's a Japanese American writer who was born in California in 1910. And his name is Toshio Mori. Mori included a story entitled Japanese Hamlet in uh, a collection he published in 1979 called The Chauvinist and Other Stories. He only published it in 1979, but he had written it 40 years earlier in 1939, or perhaps, perhaps revised it a few more times because it only appeared in print for the first time in a newspaper called The Pacific Citizen. The Pacific Citizen published this right after the Second World War, and he called the story in that version The Schoolboy Hamlet. And this Pacific Citizen was not published on the Pacific Coast. It was published in Utah, in one of the camps set up for Japanese Americans who were feared to be fifth columnists and moved from their homes in Oakland and elsewhere in this country, as Toshio Mori was, and were put into this detention camp until the end of the war. So it's extraordinary for me that this is where this story was first published. The protagonist of the story is named Tom Fukunaga. The first name is Americanized as Tom, the last name, obviously, Japanese. And for Tom Fukunaga, no matter how much he studied and read Shakespeare, he would always be a Japanese Hamlet, his race an insuperable impediment to his American dreams. What's so wonderful about this gem of a short story, it's only about 1,200 words long, is that this glaring truth cannot be spoken, not even indirectly acknowledged by the unnamed narrator, who first sympathizes with Tom, then turns against his unrealistic dream. Nor can it be acknowledged by his parents, who disown him, nor by Tom's uncle, who wants him to grow up, get a job, and fit in. Tom Fuganaga himself cannot acknowledge this problem. Shakespeare may be universal, just not that universal. An African-American, Paul Robeson, could finally play Othello on Broadway in the 1940s in America. But America in 1946 was still far from ready, and probably still is, from a Japanese-American playing the title role of Hamlet in a Broadway production. And those of you who are older and remember the way that Japanese were portrayed during and after the war know in 1946 that these ostensibly yellow-skinned devils who mangled the English language were the furthest imaginable from anyone who could play Hamlet. <sighs> Despite Tom's desire to make his mark on what he calls Shakespeare history, he never gets to audition, and he remains, quote, 
as far from a stage door in his 30s as he was in his high school days. The beauty of the story is he is Hamlet. He's stuck. He can't grow up. He can't fulfill his ambition. Ironically, his ambition is to be Hamlet, but all he can do is be Hamlet. I'll read you a little bit of it as I draw to the conclusion of my talk. The narrator describes how Tom used to come to my house and ask me to hear him recite. Each time he handed me the complete works of William Shakespeare, he never forgot to do that. He wanted me to sit in front of him, open the book, and follow him as he recited his lines. I did it willingly. There was not much for me to do in the evening, so when Tom came over, I was ready to help out almost any time. And as his love for Shakespeare's plays grew with the years, he did not want anything else in the world but to be a Shakespearean actor. I'll read from the very end of the story so you get some sense of the subtlety of this simple and powerful narrative. The narrator has turned on Tom, rejected him, told him, give up on this fantasy. Tom did not come to the house again. I guess it got so that Tom could not stand me any more than he could his uncle and parents. When he quit coming, I felt bad. I knew he'd never abandon his ambition. I was equally sure Tom would never rank with the great Shakespearean actors, but I could not forget his simple persistence. One day, years later, I saw him on the Piedmont card, 14th and Broadway. He was sitting with his head buried in a book, and I was sure it was a copy of Shakespeare's. For a moment, he looked up and stared at me as if I were a stranger. Then his face broke into a smile, and he raised his hand. I waved back eagerly. How are you, Tom? I shouted. He waved his head, his hand politely again, but he did not get off, and the car started up Broadway. The street's name is perfectly chosen because this is the only Broadway where this Asian-American lover of Shakespeare will ever get to recite Hamlet's words. And of course, Shakespeare stands in for the dominant literary culture that Toshio Mori himself, though born here, struggled with only partial success to enter. To conclude, before we open this up to conversation, it took Shakespeare to give the struggle of Toshio Mori's protagonist a local habitation and a name. The same holds true when American writers grappled with flying bombers in Vietnam or faced the drudgery of the daily suburban commute or stared at the ruins of the Twin Towers. I hope through these brief examples that I've shared with you to have given you some sense of why Shakespeare not only continues to speak to us in America, but also how we struggle to speak through Shakespeare to each other. As much as Shakespeare has become something that binds us together in American classrooms and theaters, he also remains a measure of what divides us and on occasion in the hands of powerful writers, a means to close that distance. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm here, so fire away with any questions, and I will repeat the question since you're not mic'd up, and I'll repeat it in such ways it's easier for me to answer. <laughs> A student first, I hope. Thank you. <laughs> um, so assuming that you observed some other countries when going about this, what sort of things were uniquely American about the shift in attitude that you observed because when Shakespeare's process, I mean, even in England? That's a really good question. The question to repeat is, what is Shakespearean about America as compared to my experience of Shakespeare abroad? Hank mentioned earlier that this is going to be a really big year, 2016, for Shakespeare in America, with the Folger Shakespeare Library creating 50 festivals, month-long festivals in each state, all kinds of celebrations. Virginia may be leading, but it's not alone. The same is happening around the world. I've been invited to festivals in South America, in Australia, in Italy, in England. Everybody now owns Shakespeare. I'm an American. I'm not Italian. I'm not Brazilian. I can't feel or really deeply understand, even when I see Shakespeare performed in those countries, the ways in which those countries' histories, 
are mediated through Shakespeare. I'm sure they are. And I'm hoping that someone will write a book called Shakespeare in Brazil and Shakespeare in Israel and Shakespeare elsewhere. I can give one example, perhaps, <clears throat> rather than beg off from that question. Uh, there's a book outside on the table called Shakespeare and the Jews that I wrote 20 years ago. I actually wrote it 21 years ago. <laughs> University presses take forever to publish a book. <laughs> so I finished it in 1994 and went, uh, was invited to speak uh, in Tel Aviv. And uh, at that time, there was a production of The Merchant of Venice that was being staged in Tel Aviv at the Camry Theater. And my Hebrew is pretty good. But it was a little strange watching Jews play Christians. I mean, it took a while to break through to listening to Shakespeare's play in Hebrew. And like many contemporary productions of The Merchant of Venice, Shylock was dressed in a businessman's suit and he was a secular Jew. Something happened, though, when his daughter was abducted, and he turned into a religious fanatic, and he was wearing the skull cap favored, the kind favored by the settler community, and when he confronted his adversaries, he imagined spraying them with uh, an Uzi submachine gun. The reason why the director had changed the play during the rehearsal process was in the very midst of the rehearsal, a man named Baruch Goldstein, a Brooklyn-born uh, West Bank settler and physician, had walked into the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron and shot and killed, while wearing an Israeli military uniform, 29 Palestinians and wounded 120 others before the survivors subdued and killed him. And what was extraordinary was this was a production that picked up on this and turned Shylock into a version of Baruch Goldstein. And in one of those odd ways that art anticipates or is in constant dialogue with life, less than a year later, <clears throat> Yigal Amir uh, gunned down a man who was cut from the same cloth as this Shylock gunned down Yitzhak Rabin, ending for many people the possibility of a successful resolution of the Oslo Accords. And for me, this was personal because Barak Goldstein and I had gone to the same school in Brooklyn going up, had been infused with the same ideology. And I always wonder why he became a mass murderer and I just wrote about these things. <laughs> so I think in each country you travel to, to the extent that you understand that culture, you can begin to understand the ways in which Shakespeare has and continues to play a role, not simply as somebody we worship and whose works we adore, but as somebody who helps us identify and negotiate these deep cultural divisions. Next question. So I wanted to hear more. Thank you for your lovely talk. I learned a lot from it about American productions of Shakespeare and writing on Shakespeare. And I wanted to go back to your thesis about um, Americans turning to Shakespeare to say what they can't otherwise say. Um, and you add to that this notion of um, testing suppressed truths and difficult things. I wonder if you could say more about why, why there's this turn. I mean, it seemed suggested to me by your talk that some of it has to do with childhood, like with John Quincy Adams and his mother Shakespeare, a very strong um, emotional attachment to Shakespeare, and that that's what people are channeling when they're dealing with difficult issues. But I wonder if you could. I think that's that. that's probably better put than anything I said. I mean, I think it all begins for us with certain kinds of attachments to Shakespeare and to certain Shakespeare plays, and we idealize and romanticize Shakespeare. It's hard not to. His plays have a very personal meaning for many of us. We identify with those characters. And then we go out and try to make sense of a world that is not the way we want it to be. Or we confront values in other people that are not what we want them to be. And Shakespeare inevitably stands between us and those problems. So I'm interested in not talking about celebrating 
Shakespeare in the gold rush in San Francisco or everybody going to see one thing or another. I'm interested in when push comes to shove, how Shakespeare gets in the middle, stands as a kind of blocking figure, if you will, towards a successful resolution of the issues that confront us. And let's just take an issue like immigration. Immigration is a really difficult issue in our nation right now. Without expressing any political view of it whatsoever, it's just one of the things that we're going to have to figure out or agree to disagree about or take actions that will anger a large segment of this population. I'm working with theater groups right now that are involved in two productions. One is a production of the Comedy of Errors, and it sets that play, Ephesus and um, Syracuse, as the Mexican-American border. And when Aegean crosses from one to the other, a couple of border police arrest him and pin him down. And the actor playing Aegean is an actor of color. That is using Shakespeare to try to figure something out about where we are today. And I was working with teachers who were about to go into New York City schoolrooms to talk about Pericles. <clears throat> and Pericles is set in, in a Mediterranean that we've all seen in the newspapers with little babies floating in the waves and life jackets as people try to flee Syria, make their way through Greece to Europe. The very place in which that play takes place is the place where this crisis, humanitarian crisis, and crisis of immigration and border crossing and belonging is occurring. So again and again, Shakespeare's plays can come into focus for us as a way of trying to explore issues that tend to be the kind that we can't comfortably argue over. We tend to just find people with whom we agree. I don't know if I'd be comfortable speaking with all of you about what's happening on Yale's campus today. It could get a little nasty very quickly. We could discover we don't like each other as much as we thought we did. Shakespeare acts as a kind of buffer in this as well, because we all can agree to disagree about Shakespeare. Yes? So that's sort of a very moderate frame. I mean, you're, you're positioning Shakespeare as, as a mediator. I'm curious if, there, if you see a radical Shakespeare in, in America, because certainly Jane Addams is such a, and she's very conflicted and very moderate and using Shakespeare in Hull House in ways that are um, questionable. Um, are, are, do, wait, when, you, when you were compiling this volume, did you find sort of um, uses of Shakespeare in the American radical tradition? That is a really good question that I've never thought of until you've asked it just now. The truth really is, and this sounds terrible and doesn't necessarily correspond with my own political beliefs, there tends to be a moderating element deeply within the American literary tradition. So the most radical things are written, say, in communist papers, celebrating an African American who's a communist playing a fellow on Broadway. But even then, it's in the same kind of hyperbolic terms that you would find in the New York Times in a Ben Bradley review. That Shakespeare is not ever used in or consistently used by those on the political left extreme or political right extreme, that he tends to be part of a conversation that can be a shared conversation. Why that is, I don't know, because I could point to many examples in which Coriolanus banned after World War II in Germany because it was seen as too close to reinforcing the idea of a Fuhrer. You know, there, there are times when things get really fraught with Shakespeare. <laughs> But in this country, that has not been the case, not even with Astor Place, where people shed blood over Shakespeare, which is not something that's happened in many other places. Please. So is your America the United States of America, or is it North, North America? Because in the Caribbean, the Tempest, there's certainly a tradition that would um, address some of what's happening. I think it, as soon as you move to the Caribbean, you're dealing with responses to a colonial set of issues, especially with the Tempest, yeah. that are extraordinary. And so my 
America is the 50 states of America. And uh, it, it, it includes uh, Hawaii and, and Alaska, but doesn't go north to Canada, which has its own complicated history as a Commonwealth nation with uh, you know, its ties to the British crown, and certainly not with Central and South America and the Caribbean. And uh, that is by choice. I have a hard enough time you know, coming to Virginia and <laughs> This is a strange part of the country for me, as you would find my neighborhood and my number one train a strange and alien place. So even as we speak of ourselves as Americans, one of the things that Shakespeare points out is they're really different, different Americas. You just have to walk a few miles and you're in a different America, sometimes less than a few miles. It was enough for me to wrap my head around these 50 states Barely, and I visited perhaps two thirds of them in my life. But it's a country that accommodates many, many things. But we think of ourselves as American. And I think Shakespeare is one of the things that actually helps us think of ourselves as American. And it's perverse that it should be so, because we broke from the country that produced him, and we should have turned our back and developed a national literature of our own really quickly. And we could have had our own Shakespeare's, but we did not. So in a way, it speaks to a, a, a kind of dependency which I'm uncomfortable with, but that's the reality of it. I mean, when our founding fathers, future presidents, go to Stratford-upon-Avon and kiss the ground and buy cheap souvenirs that told came from Shakespeare's chair, something's wrong to me in that story. But that's not to answer the question of, you're right, as soon as you move past the 50 states, it's a radically different story. African Shakespeare's a different story as well. Sir. Quick anecdote also from Brooklyn <coughs> uh, and about assimilation. My grandmother, born in 1869, Irish Catholic working class family two generations away from the Gaelic language, was immensely proud to her dying day and told me the story several times when I was a little kid that every year in the big family group, cousins, etc., the two brightest children after First Communion celebration, one gave a recitation of a patriotic oration and one gave a recitation of a passage from Shakespeare. Wow. Grandma got the passage from Shakespeare. She was boastful about that. This would have been probably 1880. She, in the 19... 50s, shortly before her death in her 80s, she was still telling that story. Now, this is a conjecture. I don't think my family was so extremely uncommon. I'll bet that researching back in family histories, you would find hundreds, probably thousands, of families who celebrated their assimilation to the United States, whatever their previous ethnicity had been, in some fashion or other, by going to a Shakespeare play, by holding a Shakespeare recitation, or the like. Uh, I'm particularly proud of the fact, since you're from Brooklyn, <laughs> that I could verify that this was yeah. going on in Brooklyn. Uh, but I suspect that it was going on all over the place. I, I think you're right. And I, I, I've been working with, uh, or speaking with, a group of documentary filmmakers who are going about New York City trying to find people 80, 90 years old, stopping them on the street and saying, did you memorize any Shakespeare when you were young? They go right into it. The quality of mercy is not strained. As if they've been waiting for this moment for a half a century, and they don't miss a word. And I know that because I've seen these clips of impromptu recitations. And I think you're right. It's a way of belonging to that America. There's something else that your, your astute observation raised for me. And that's the way in which it becomes part of who we are individually, that these speeches we commit to memory. And I say this in a culture where we just Google everything and no longer need to memorize anything, um, are really important to our individual identities, not just to our American identities. Uh, a month ago, I, I wrote an op-ed that Hank mentioned, 
disagreeing with the Argonne Shakespeare's Festival's decision to, to change Shakespeare's language into what they described as modern English. Now, there is no modern English. There's Virginian English, there's Brooklyn English, there's Jamaican Brooklyn English. There are a million modern Englishes, but there's no one voice that we all speak in. And I got a letter from a, uh, a writer, I think she was in her 70s or a little older than that perhaps, and she described to me how her husband had been suffering from Alzheimer's for many years and was really unable to communicate. But right before the end of his life, and I don't know enough about Alzheimer's to know the ways in which the things you learn first you hold on to last, but he recited verbatim a pair of lines from Othello. I loved you for the things you had undergone and you loved me for sharing them. I don't want to even botch it by missing the quotation. And she said these lines he spoke and they meant so much to her. And it's not as if he could have said I liked you a lot and you liked me too and had the same impact. There was something about the ways in which this Shakespeare had been so deeply embedded within him that it was one of the last things to go. And I think it kind of correlates with what you were saying. I don't want to hold you too long. I'll take two more questions. In the back, yes. A lot of the earlier works uh, in the anthology, like Peter Parko's 1775 Ode to Shakespeare, talk about how the United States is the national inheritor of Shakespeare and that uh, England no longer deserves or is worthy of being the primary representative of Shakespeare as early as before the revolution began. And so have you, did you see that early trend, I guess, in trying to appropriate Shakespeare in the United States continue through the? There was tremendous anxiety in this country about separating from Britain and yet latching onto the coattails of Britain's national poet. There's just no way around it. You just read Melville writing about Hawthorne and he's just hand-wringing. A Shakespeare is being born today on you know, the banks of uh, you know, the Mississippi or whatever. Not that river, but a different river. Um, <laughs> they just want to believe that we can create our own. We haven't yet. We created a number of spectacular writers, hundreds of them, and we figured out how to somehow Americanize Shakespeare. God, God bless that. <laughs> Let me take one last question. Please. Um, I'm actually going to kind of go to the other end of the time rainbow here. When you mentioned how we're not ready for a Japanese Hamlet, I thought immediately of the Kenneth Branagh HBO film As You Like It, which is in this. Japanese setting, and I looked it up to be sure because it's been a while since I've seen it, that you've got black and white actors in all the major roles, and it's very clearly this 19th century imperialist setting, and the Japanese actors are some of the very minor servants, and I mean, what do you think of that, and why aren't we ready for a Japanese Hamlet? And I meant a Japanese Hamlet on Broadway because there have been scores and scores of Japanese Americans who have played Hamlet, uh, so I'm really talking about a Broadway performance much like Paul Robeson could play Othello on Broadway. I think there are economic explanations for that. I think there are um, expectations of audiences. Just imagine for a second, are people going to drop 150 bucks to go see a Japanese American play Hamlet? Not the people who drop 150 bucks on Broadway today. They won't do that. And I work much of my time when I'm not teaching at Columbia with the public theater created by Joe Papp in the 1950s, which is committed to having the people on stage reflect the racial and ethnic and other makeup of those in the audience. And I think American Shakespeare has been much better at that than British Shakespeare or Irish Shakespeare or Israeli Shakespeare, or any other Shakespeare, and that is one of the great things about Shakespeare in America today. Have I seen a Japanese American play Hamlet on Broadway? It's been a long time since Hamlet has been on Broadway. <laughs> we can only hope for both. Thank you.